constant change from summer to winter, motion to rest, life to death. Fascinated by the success of accountants and surveyors, he invented mathematical proof. Looking at the heavens and at the records of navigators and calendar makers, he conceived a universe of spheres. Building on the law of bone setters and apothecaries, the philosopher began an exploration of the human body that extended to the whole living world. Such was the house of science 200 years before Christ. Greatly elaborated, first in the Roman world, then in the Islamic. This heritage was transmitted to the medieval scientist. But great social and technological changes were rocking the medieval world. Increased leisure, freedoms. By the time of the Renaissance, the sciences were being affected. Vesalius shocked medical tradition, studied anatomy from human corpses. His naturalistic charts of the body laid a foundation for Harvey's work on valves and veins. A revival of European mathematics later led to calculus. With an insight of beautiful simplicity, Copernicus reversed the positions of the Earth and Sun. Kepler stretched the orbits into ellipses. Galileo provided laws of motion, which Newton elaborated to cover apples, cannonballs and planets. For the first time, man had reason to view the universe as an infinite machine. While new ideas had been transforming the established sciences, new attitudes were producing new sciences. As learned men, inspired partly by the crafts, began to systematically study and record countless facts of everyday life. The marine compass led them to electricity and magnetism, alchemy and the chemical crafts to the study of chemical change. Mining and fossils to geology, drugs and herbs to botany. Concern with human anatomy expanded to all of organic life. By the beginning of the 19th century, practical skills became controlled experiment and merged with theory to produce the main branches of modern science. With increasing vigor, they themselves began to grow and subdivide. At this point, science, a subject for the naturally curious now became intensely practical as well. It began to repay its debt to technology. With this impetus, science began the almost explosive stage of growth that we are witnessing today. This is the house of science as it is today. These are the men that inhabit the house, that work in it, live in it, build it. This is about what scientists look like. And these are the places they do their work. From the outside, the buildings are about as varied as the scientists themselves. Large and small, young and old. On the inside, it is remarkable how many of the laboratories look exactly as a laboratory should look. Some have the glassware apparatus and tidiness of an alchemist's workshop. Others have a complexity of instrumentation that is overwhelming. These are the fields that have now become highly specialized. Their instruments penetrate regions far outside human experience. But today, as in the past, a laboratory can be many things in many places. It 
can be a stagnant pool, or the light of the sun, or the sun itself. The thought of our nearest neighbor as a laboratory has now become very real, and the space just beyond our Earth is almost familiar territory. The atmosphere is a dense but thin coat that carries our weather and our winds. The rain it bears has molded and worked the surface of the land. The crust of the Earth holds fascination and wonder for the scientist. In it, he observes phenomena of his own time, and with equal familiarity, he investigates incidents of ages past. It was here in the rich waters of the sea, a billion years ago, that the rhythms of all life were set that all the living things we know had their beginnings. When animals or insects or birds or men living communities, then the society they form becomes a laboratory. In it can be studied the culture and the units of which it is made. The people. The objects they make and use are the subjects of scientific inquiry, as are their means of expression, their customs and their ideas. The mind of man can be a laboratory. The laboratory can be anywhere that the scientist is drawn to look. He scrutinizes his world of interest as carefully as his senses will allow, and as his inquiry becomes more critical, he seeks to extend his natural senses. The lens is a simple tool that extends the sense of sight into a realm of smaller things. The microscope does much the same, but the jump to higher magnification is so spectacular, it reveals another world. farther into space than anything that we have ever known. It explores the universe billions of light years away. This is exploration in the same old-fashioned sense, that the environment is not always too friendly. The sense of time can be altered by slowing the very fast, or by speeding the very slow, or by catching an instant and holding it. Most sensing devices read directly as measurement. Because its accuracy often determines the quality of his data, the scientist can be very particular about measurement and the instruments that do it. By international agreement, the standard of linear measurement is no longer a mark on a stick. It is now the wavelength of light from excited Krypton 86. Other measurements have become about as esoteric. With instruments sensing, measuring and recording data, information accumulates at a staggering rate. A new tool, the electronic computer, 
can sift through, condense and relate tremendous amounts of data at such great speed that complex theories for handling information become exceedingly practical. This comes close to the heart of science, where theories and concepts are the working tools. With a special kind of curiosity and a sense of elegance, the scientist uncovers hidden relationships. From these and others, he builds intellectual constructions. To help maintain the necessary perspective, the scientist uses many devices. He writes himself notes. He builds three-dimensional models to actually experience relationships. He creates different images of the same concept to see it in different ways. He writes papers. He delivers papers, he publishes, and he tries his notions on his friends. It would be impossible to tell from the intensity of the discussion whether they are talking about a questionable cosmology or the proper labeling of a butterfly specimen. Science is essentially an artistic or philosophical enterprise carried on for its own sake. In this, it is more akin to play than work. But it is quite a sophisticated play in which the scientist views nature as a system of interlocking puzzles. He assumes that the puzzles have a solution, that they will be fair. He holds to a faith in the underlying order of the universe. His motivation is his fascination with the puzzle itself. His method, a curious interplay between idea and experiment. His pleasures are those of any artist. High on the list of prerequisites for being a scientist is a quality that defines the rich human being as much as it does the man of science. That is, his ability and his desire to reach out with his mind and his imagination to something outside himself.